May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you in these days. We welcome you to worship this morning at Park Presbyterian Church. It's a delight to have everyone gathering virtually as we are worshiping physically apart but spiritually together. And we give thanks for the love of God in God's Son, Jesus Christ, that draws us together by the power of the Spirit. A few announcements this morning before we begin our worship. Uh, the session met on Wednesday evening and they were delighted to approve the Park Pastor Nominating Committee's ministry information form. Kudos to the PNC for this document that will begin conversations with candidates in the upcoming months. Some of the services that we have available for us as we are doing this virtual world of worship and church, we have a bookmobile and you can access the list of some of the church library's books online and have them delivered. Um, we have individuals who are willing to do grocery runs or pharmacy pickups. Um, we want you to be in contact with Matt Stewart about that, uh, coordinating that anyway, and he'll farm it out to some of our volunteers. Um, Elliot Kramer is our tech guy in these days, and we are creating some mini messages, words of encouragement that we will try to put up about three times a week on our Facebook website, or our Facebook site and on our website. And uh, those kinds of things are all um, good and helping us stay connected. The, we had a project for a cookbook ongoing before this time came upon us. And that committee suggests that in these days when you're alone a lot at home, you might read some cookbooks, look through some recipe files, and submit some of those. So those are just a few things that are on our minds as we prepare to worship. Uh, and we hope that you are being safe and healthy and well taken care of by family and friends. And again, don't hesitate to call upon your park family to uh, help you in these days. Let us worship the Lord our God. We prepare to enter into worship as we join in singing Spirit of the Living God. join responsively in our litany for Lent. In the buds on the trees, eager to burst, in the flowers poking their heads out of the dirt, in the children chalking spring on the sidewalks, we see how you treasure us, God of love. In the tears of a worried father over his son's illness, in the weariness of a mother facing a long shift at work, in the woman who anoints her grandbaby with talcum powder, we see how you love us, God of hope. In the touch of a wife on her husband's papery skin, in the birds which rush into the sky before spiraling down, in the words we are given to offer to the empty-hearted we see how you love us, God of forever. Amen. Our opening hymn is, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. I invite you to join with Eric and sing along in this wonderful song. Oh, 
There are things in this life which we ought not to have done. There are things which we have left undone. Our God is a God who is patient and steadfast, merciful, abounding in love. Please join with me in the prayer of confession as we pray together saying, have mercy on us, living Lord. Remember not our sin. According to your steadfast love, come, cleanse us deep within. So come and purify our lives, our hearts with love redeem. Restore us to your life-filled ways. Come, Lord, and make us clean. In Jesus' name, amen. We can put our hope and trust in God, for God offers us that love which never fades, life which never ends. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And as we are forgiven, we are granted that special blessing of a peace that comes as only Christ can give. So from my heart to yours, the peace of Christ be with you. to hear God's word. The first scripture lesson today is from the 130th Psalm, beginning at verse 1. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We invite the children to come and gather around the computer as uh, we often do here in the front of the sanctuary for a little time to chat together. Now, I have brought some things along this morning and uh, you can see that I've got a, a couple of different twigs here. I'm going to start with this one uh, because, well, there are signs of spring around us all over. But as I walked through the park this uh, morning in the bright sunshine, and I noticed that uh, this tree still had some winter leaves on it. Last summer, these leaves were bright green and nice 
and then uh, most of their mates fell off. But this tree is still hanging on to some, some leaves and its buds, these are the buds, are very, very small still. This is a different kind of a tree. And this one, you can see the buds are starting to swell. They're starting to get a little bit bigger. And in a few weeks, they're going to turn into beautiful dogwood flowers. I'm not sure if this one is white or pink. I don't really remember from last spring, but we have beautiful dogwoods around the church. And this one was right out the window from my office. And then Roxanne brought in something that is already blooming. A few weeks ago, it looked more like this than it does like this. But this forsythia flower began to emerge from its long winter nap and to show its beautiful, beautiful color. Now, it had been months since it went to sleep since it dropped its leaves last, oh, probably October. And so November, December, January, February, March, for five months, this forsythia has been sleeping away, pulled back, not showing any signs of life. And then the buds began to swell and the flowers came out and life was blooming again. These different, different types of trees and flowers remind us that everything happens in a, a wonderful way in God's creation. And even though things are out of sync and you are not in school this, these weeks and the spring things that you're supposed to be doing in school aren't working out. In God's creation, it's going forward. And so this, when we see these signs, they remind us of God's love and that God will bring all this around to days when we can go out and play in the sunshine and be back with our friends again. So these are signs of assurance for me and they give me hope each day when I see new things emerge. So I hope they give you a little hope and your families a little hope this week too. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for each of our children and for their families, for their moms and dads and their caretakers in these days. And we pray, Lord, your blessing upon them. Give them an extra abundant dose of patience that they can be home together and help them to find creative and wonderful ways to just survive these weeks. Know that, help them to know that in time, whether it's weeks or a month or even more, that all this will come to an end and we will have spring and summer and wonderful times again. Amen.
hide me in his tabernacle. Yea, in the secret places of his dwelling shall he hide me. And Our second scripture lesson today comes from the prophet Ezekiel, the 37th chapter beginning at verse 1, the vision of the valley of dry bones. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and you will, co- and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh came upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Can we bring this old house back to life? We had moved to Butler County and were living in a rental and were looking for a home to buy. We had owned a couple of fixer-uppers along the way in life, and so we were looking for a project house, one we could invest some sweat equity in, and one that, well, that was good and sound, one that had good bones, if you will. We were really looking for a nice craftsman bungalow, but those weren't on the market that time, and we came across this old Victorian farmhouse, sort of a folk Victorian home. It had been turned into a two-apartment uh, two apartment rental, an upstairs and a downstairs. They'd flip the stairs around, put a front porch on what used to be the back of the house, and done some really interesting things. But... The roof line was straight. The doors all hung fairly good. We didn't see any places where if you set a marble down on the wood floor, it would take off like a rocket. So we decided to go for it. And as we gutted it out, we found out that yes, indeed it had been a good candidate for a restoration project because it had good bones. Mary was in the kitchen, trying her hand at baking bread. The dough had, uh, and she were having a real tug of war that morning. It appeared as if the dough ball was winning when her mom happened to pop in the side door. Just passing through the neighborhood and thought I'd say hi. In despair, Mary leaned on the counter, knuckles buried deep in the dough, eyes puddling. It was only her second go at baking bread, and she'd so much wanted to get this right for her young family. Mom dropped her purse, took one look at the situation, and came alongside her Mary. And together they talked about what had happened so far and began adding touches of flour and kneading a little bit and adding more to the bread and, and to the breadboard and gently turning and kneading. A bit more flour after each minute or so of working the dough until it began to release its stickiness from Mary's fingers with a nice snap, leaving all those sticky bits of dough on the ball and her fingers clean as could be. We've all faced these kinds of situations in life. Some so small we think, why did it really matter? Some significant. The next years of our life depend upon it. But in comparison to what we are looking at today in the story from Ezekiel, well, that story is more like a, a wonderful cherry pie where you accidentally substituted the salt for the sugar. Ruined, irredeemable, messed up. Now, before we dig too deep into Ezekiel, we want to talk a little bit about the gospel lesson, which I did not read today. It's, it's a familiar story. It's the story of Jesus raising of Lazarus from the grave. Lazarus is sick and dying, and Jesus and his disciples are out of town. A runner is sent with an urgent message. Come quickly. Your friend Lazarus is dying. You can do something about it. Jesus delays a couple days. It seems intentional, the way the story is told. And then he comes to Bethany to his dear friends, Mary and Martha. And in their grief, they are weeping. Jesus consoling them is also filled with grief. He weeps with them. Then he turns to the gravesite, asks that the stone from the grave be removed. And he commands in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And resurrection happens. 
Margaret O'Dell says that in the Ezekiel dry bones story, as they are knit back together and infused with life-giving breath, and in the John story of Lazarus, where life is brought back after four days in the tomb, both of those are stories that are not pretty. Resurrection is not new life, the perfect promise of a newborn babe, but it is renewed life, life forged out of death, life forged out of the messiness. Even Jesus in his resurrection still bore the scars. We aren't quite to that story in our journey yet. We're still in Lent. Yet, with all its brutal honesty, Ezekiel's vision challenges us to see that the problem is not in death, but in the fear of it. The problem is not in death, but in the fear of it. And the solution? God's ever-present gift of life. It is as near to us as breathing. In the grim vision that God gives the prophet Ezekiel, we are reminded of all that has happened since Ezekiel was first summoned to speak as a prophet to the rebellious house of Israel. Now, Ezekiel began his prophetic days uh, about five years or so before the fall of Jerusalem, when Nebuchadnezzar's army uh, sealed the fate and took the leaders of Jerusalem out into exile. The political leaders, the religious leaders, prominent businessmen and women, the, the leaders of the community, all of their families were rounded up and trekked off. We're reminded in that scene of a broken covenant, the covenant that God had with God's people and the unspeakable loss that God's people felt as they left the promised land bound for exile. We may also be asked to remember Ezekiel's commission as a prophet to sound the warning in the hope that some might hear, repent, and live. The sheer number of bones there in the valley suggests uh, perhaps a prophetic failure. And God's question to Ezekiel can only remind us of that grim fact. Mortal, can these bones live? And at the end of his own imagining, Ezekiel can only leave it up to God. Oh God, you alone know. Any new life, all new life, all restoration of life is God's doing. Only by the Spirit of God. In this vision, in Ezekiel's life, in the life of the Israelites in exile, in all of the lives of all of us who shelter in place too. New life, restoration of life, is found in God. As Ezekiel prophesies, the bones come together with a great rattling, quaking as sinew and flesh and skin come on the bones, but there is still no breath in them. So God commands Ezekiel to prophesy again, this time to the breath or the wind, the Hebrew word ruach. There are parallels with similar expressions of that command in the Psalms, and they suggest that they feel themselves cut off from God's presence perhaps because they perceive the covenant to have been severed, certainly because absence from Jerusalem's temple closes off any possibility of seeking God 
For the exiles being cut off from God means they are as good as dead. But in verses 11 through 14, God shows Ezekiel that the dry bones represent the whole house of Israel. Their gripe is this. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. This is a further clue that their identity and their concerns are not just about death, but about their life now. These are not the ones who were slain in Jerusalem, but those who have survived and gone into exile. The dry bones actually represent the living exiles, then it turns out that the entire vision is concerned not so much with death, but with despair. Our life in the face of this COVID-19 pandemic might feel a good bit like a ruined pie, struck down with salt that cannot become sweet again. It truly is much more than big questions about a house restoration project or a stubborn, sticky bread dough ball. So as we lay our lives alongside this story, we feel the hopelessness, we feel the despair of the Israelites. And to that hopelessness of exile, God offers a startling, simple metaphor of divine presence, the ready availability of breath. In just 14 verses, the word ruach has occurred nine times, and it is variously translated breath and wind, and finally as God's very own spirit. We would lose the metaphorical force of this usage if we neatly differentiated between the meanings, whether it appears in one instance as breath or in another as wind, it is all the same life-giving force. All life comes from God. And it is in this sense that breathing becomes a metaphor for divine presence. Despite the exile's fear of being cut off from God, God is as near to them as their very own breath. This dry bones vision does nothing to alleviate them of their present difficult circumstances, but it promises them a future in their own land. Though they remain in exile, still mourning the loss of familiar ways to find and meet God, they are reassured of God's presence. The restoration to life, to the dry bones, reminds them that because God is present, they can breathe and stand ready for the future, looking forward in hope. In the face of our own days of isolation and separation, of loss of jobs and incomes, of fear of illness for ourselves or for those we love, of fear of our health care providers and the whole system being overwhelmed, of concerns maybe beyond my imagination, in these days, we are offered the promises of God. We can listen to these words of old taking on new life in every breath we take. So friends, this week, breathe. Breathe in the breath of God. Know that you are wonderfully made. Breathe out the fear, the pain, the anxiousness. Breathe. Breathe in the Holy Spirit with which binds us together in faith. Breathe. Breathe in the goodness of Christ who comes to us in our times of need, who holds us and weeps with us and offers us his peace. Breathe. 
Breathe in the fresh wind of divine love. Breathe in God's vision of life restored, that we may truly live into hope. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith. God is the question with whom we contend throughout our lives. God is the one standing there in the closing of the doors and the opening of the windows. God is the surprising voice that calls us in the jaggedness of life. God is the hand that keeps the world from snuffing out the stars. God is the poem that begins and ends in a circle. God is the circle that neither begins nor ends. Friends, I invite you to join in singing along with Eric, His Eye is on the Sparrow. In morning prayer, there are a couple of prayer concerns that I wish to lift up. Uh, there have been some deaths in the Greater Park family, and so we want to uh, remember the Leslie family, the Lida and Rich family, and uh, the family of our uh, retired uh, ex Presbytery Executive Alan Adams, whose father passed away in Florida this last week. Uh, health concerns for Cliff and Don and Andy and for Marilyn and um, those things that are on your hearts this morning. Let us pray together. 
God of forever. As we watch the buds swell and the flowers emerge, as we see the dance of daffodils in yards and along roadsides, emerging from a long winter sleep, as we feel the gentleness of a spring rain, the dawning of each new day. O Holy One, we are reminded of your eternal presence. For even as these weeks feel like a long eternity to us, they are but a blink of an eye to you. And it is into your eternal presence that we lean, into your power that is the power of love and hope and creation, the power of healing, the power of life itself. O oh, gracious God, we pray for those families that are mourning today, especially the Leslie, Lida, Rich, and Adams families, for those who are sick and need your healing touch, for Cliff and Dawn, for Andy and Marilyn. We pray for those who sit at the bedside of a loved one, knowing that they will soon enter into their eternal rest. O oh, gracious God, in this season when we are asked to stay home, we pray for those who are traveling in order to get home. We pray in this season of separation for those who are apart from their families, especially in situations where loved ones are in nursing homes and personal care homes. We ask, Lord, that you grant us the patience of a mother robin. Gift us with the peace that comes as only you can give. Pour out your spirit, we pray. On those who are in hospital with COVID or many of the other things and fear for their exposures. We pray for those who are caring for the ill, who are on the front lines of providing care and cleaning and sustenance. We pray for those striving to keep our communities here in our county and around the world safe. We pray for those who are working to keep our country safe and especially those who are overseas in these days. We lift up grandsons and sons of this congregation, Andrew and Dan. Unite us now, great God, in one voice as we pray as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We take a moment today to encourage those uh, to who are regular supporters of Park Church to send your offerings in for in this season when we are apart, we still have bills to pay and payroll to take care of and the, the usual utilities and that type of thing going on. So as you are able, we encourage you to send us your check or uh, do the electronic fund transfers that you are used to. Uh, in a few days, we hope to have up and operating a uh, ability of folks who are not always part of our congregation to give electronically through our web page, but that's, a, again, a work in progress, our, as are so many things in these days. We thank you for your support of 
Park Church, our church, your church in these days. Now let us join in singing, Be Thou My Vision. Now, may the love of God uphold you. May the peace of Christ enfold you. And may the Holy Spirit fill you with the breath of life this day and each day. As all God's people say, amen.